January 8, 1992, the local television news in my hometown of Detroit recorded the scene outside my uncle's store. He had just been shot and killed in a robbery. I wasn't able to go to his funeral, so in Los Angeles where I now live, I played the videotape and watched my family as they grieved for my uncle. After watching this TV story unfold, I wanted to tell my own story beyond these images. It's a simple story of some of the people who live in our cities. I dream a dream of an image of ourselves, an image broadcast into the heart of our homes. It's just like a bomb. It's a bomb. We're sitting on a bomb. No justice, no peace! No justice, no peace! Just months after my uncle's murder in Detroit, the riots broke out in Los Angeles. The live media coverage focused on black Korean relations. It is the hostility and resentment blacks feel for Koreans who have come to their neighborhoods as enterprising merchants. Deadly anger erupted in an orgy of burning and looting. I don't know why. Why Korean people lie? But because there was no respect there. The image is powerful and it takes root in our souls. It feeds our fear, it feeds our anger. I felt the television wasn't getting the story right, so I drove into South Central to see for myself what was happening. I brought along my movie camera. I drove first to the Loha Market, a grocery store run by another aunt and uncle. It's in the middle of the riot area at Vermont and 24th. Fires had already consumed the building across the street, but their business was luckily spared. I left their store and traveled deeper into South Central. The more I filmed, the more I thought about my family's store in downtown Detroit. My parents came from Korea and opened up a store selling wigs to African American women. For almost three decades, I never knew of a black Korean conflict until I saw it on television. I wondered how my own personal family experiences could be so different from what I saw on TV. Now lost in the middle of the riots, I wasn't sure of what I saw on the streets of Los Angeles, but I was certain that there was more behind the TV image. I draw the line. I, I never wanted to cover a war, and yet here I am in my own backyard. I feel like I'm covering a war right here, and the gentleman said, yeah, but at least in a war you know who your enemy is. That could be Beirut, folks. It could be Saigon during the Vietnam War. Yep, yep. Oh, oh no. All right, what we've got we a live here? picture. The image is powerful, and it takes root in our souls. It feeds our fear. It feeds our anger. I searched for answers in the ruins of a city. I wanted to see what life was like when the television news cameras weren't around. And somehow, by looking for answers in LA, I also felt that I would understand more about my family's business and about my uncle's murder in Detroit, 2,000 miles away. I wanted to know why so many Korean immigrants choose to do business in African American communities. So I began my search in the heart of South Central with the Slas and Swap Meet an inner-city mall where 90% of the merchants are Korean-American and 90% of the customers are African-American. The Sloss and Swap Meet is the only business of its kind that survived the riots in South Central. I just be looking at shoes and stuff. I don't I really know clothes, person like that. And boys. <laughs> yeah, and boys, you know. Y'all look for boys right here. Then, that's it. I like to wear things that nobody else wears. And if you shop here, your whole neighborhood will have the same thing that you have. Well, at least my whole neighborhood. If you just want to come here just to get something real quick, you can come in here and get it. You know they got it. You know, why I go to the mall and waste a lot of money you can just come here? A lot of people is high, and they don't even got nothing cute. You here, you can come, you can find a little outfit like this is one piece. Ninety percent of our customers are uh, Afro-Americans, and other percentages, Hispanics, and uh, we got different people of different ethnic background and so forth doing business together problems arise as in any other type of business. It's like an intimidation be between each other, you know, the, the Koreans, the Hispanics, the blacks. The blacks, I think the African Americans don't really want to come in here, but they just have to come in here because this, this is where they, they live and where they have to shop. There's a little tension with the black and a, and a Korean 
you know, in this area because a lot of the Koreans, they choose to do business in this area, but anybody that do business in the black American area or in a low poverty area, no matter what race it is, they're going to have their problems because it's low poverty. They don't have any money and the crime is high, you know. you just here, you know, to pretty much to spend money and the Koreans are here to make money. So it's basically just an average relationship between anybody, you know, selling and the, you know, the seller or the purchaser. Does it make a difference? I don't think it has necessarily anything to do with just the fact that Korean Americans are here, that black Americans live here and don't own anything. I think that's the problem, that they don't own the majority of the thing, the things that basically keep their community going. They have no control of that. For approximately 10 years, the building where we stand today was empty. When the swap meet opened, we decided, oh, all these Asian businessmen can't come here in our community and make money off of us. Black community members came to me and said, let's go boycott the sloss and swap meet. My initial response is, sounds like a great idea. I love a good fight. Many times, people who don't know what the swap meet does, they say things like, well, the vendors take the money and run out of the community with it and doesn't give anything back. But that's, that's not true. I found out the Slauson Swap Meet was donating thousands of dollars to various churches in the community. And they were giving money to whoever told them they should give money to. But nobody in our community knew that anything was being put back. They're pretty busy in the community. They're always doing things. Like today, we had Operation Nice Day. They go around and clean up the graffiti and get a lot of different organizations together. Everybody come together, the people in the community, the neighborhoods, they all get together and they see from this property here, you know, on how everybody can get together and make things happen. On that occasion, I proudly put on my hanbok. I'm probably the largest person in the city of Los Angeles with a hanbok, but I wear it very proudly. I'm <laughs> 땅도 적고 사람도 많고 차도 많고 또 어렸을 때부터 사람들이 미국에 대한 이렇게 무슨 꿈이 있잖아요. 왜 옛날에 이제 물자가 풍부하고 미국이 그렇다 보니까 그런 것 때문에 사람들이 좀더 나은 생활을 할수 있다고 생각하고 오는 것 같아요. 저가 이민 온 거는 벌써 한 9년 정도 됐거든요. 근데 그때만 해도 그 한국하고 그 여러 가지 그 사회 구조라든지 아니면 그, 그 생활 수준 같은 게또 <웃음> 거의 10년 전이니까 많이 차이 나고 그랬고 굉장히 좀 발전된 사회라고 그렇게 또 사실이 그랬고 그랬는데 지금 현실로서는 한국도 많이 적이 됐기 때문에 지금 뭐 여기 생활 구조 자체는 지금 한국이 워낙 많이 변했기 때문에 이래 그 수준 자체는 한국도 여기 못지 않잖아요. 마켓 almost five year 했어요 히스패닉 빌리지에서 그랬는데 누구 이렇게 죽는 거 보고선 권총 강도 들어와서 죽는 거 보고. 가게를 팔았어요 무서워서 그리고는 이제 시큐리티 시설이 잘돼 있는 곳을 찾았어요 그래갖고 여기가 제일 낫다고 생각해서 여기 들어왔는데 들어와서 보니까 안전해서 있다 보니까 오래 있게 됐어요. I was born in Ghana, which is on the west coast of Africa. I've been to school in England. I've been to school in uh, Malaysia, which is in Southeast Asia. And uh, I got here like 1991, still on a steady mission. Actually, I think the whole world has a very different outlook of this neighborhood once they mention South Central, but uh, to the best of my knowledge and experience, I would say it's perfectly okay for a beginner in business for me. I mean, everything has been perfectly positive so far for me. LA is a Korean people's perspective. I didn't see the Korean people from South Central in Korea, but I saw a lot of Korean people. 가능하면 사람 사람들이 이제 그런 걸 그런 피해를 안 보려고 매려 뭐 몸을 살인 때문에 좀 이상한지만 조심을 좀 하는 편이죠. Je viens de l'Afrique de l'Ouest, je suis du Sénégal. Comme tout Africain, c'était un rêve pour moi de venir aux États-Unis, de voir ce que c'est la vie aux États-Unis. J'aime ce que je fais, mais me mettre derrière un comptoir avec des produits exotiques, ben reflétant ben l'image de l'Afrique. Parce qu'après tout, je suis africain. Tu vois, si j'avais la nationalité américaine, je vais rester africaine. De source, de pensée et de tout. Parce que ben, je ne peux pas renier mes origines. Après tout, je suis africain, je suis noir. Ben, et puis, je n'ai pas de problème avec mes euh, frères euh, euh, américains, noirs. 
Et puis, je n'ai pas de problème également avec mes collègues coréens, comme mes collègues euh, mexicains ou des choses comme ça. On travaille en paix, il y a l'unité, ben, on s'entend, on se sourit, on se dit bonjour, bonsoir. Et puis, le soir, tout le monde est à la maison. Ce n'est pas parce que tu sois américain que tu, juste, tu as droit au rêve américain. Le rêve américain, c'est pour le français, c'est pour l'africain, c'est pour l'asiatique. Si tu crois, comme je te le disais auparavant, ben, si tu crois en toi, si tu crois en toi-même, tu work hard. Mais il n'y a pas de façon que tu peux You just have to believe you and say wherever you it doesn't matter the color or where your origin. Yeah, but that's that's my opinion. While making this film, events in Los Angeles mirrored events in Detroit. And I found myself returning to my aunt's and uncle's market in South Central, the one that I visited during the riots. This is a slice of California. This is a slice of America right here in this neighborhood. It's been a community where people start out and work hard and send their children to school. And the people who come here become a part of this community. I have known about this community since 1949. And I've seen the same thing happen over and over again. And Mr. and Mrs. Hahn represent that ideal that this community has stood for. Riot time, they tried to burn down to my store building about three times. It's the same night. But my uh, neighborhood, they protect. And they continue, they uh, watch to uh, our store every day until in the morning, three o'clock. They do. It's a good neighborhood, you know. We came here from Korea, 1976, January 13. It's over 18 years now. But during time, only we have vacation. Uh, her, about two years ago, her mom's birthday, about two weeks in Korea. And me and her, 1983, about two weeks in Korea. And uh, we went all employed. We going 1978, going uh, Vegas and Grand Canyon, about four days. No, three days. Three days, three, three days over four. This is more or less a community store here. Everybody comes in, everybody knows that this is a store that you can depend on. I mean, they open up every day, and everybody finds that they're hardworking people, very agreeable people, and a great help to the community. When I was in Korea, uh, my job was a, was a white collar job, and we are, we are every management, every supervising my job, but over here, no, no choice. You have to look for retail business. But a friend of mine's recommend suggestion to market is more easier. Trabajando aquí pa aquí pa lo amarte llevo cuatro años, cuatro años dos meses por ahí. Me entiendo bien porque porque la porque la dueña habla habla español y el señor también un poco español. Nos entendemos bien. Ya apuntado, no apuntado ya. Es un poco más tranquilo aquí. Yo siempre he vivido aquí en este barrio. Y no, nunca. He... Sí, sí, como en todas partes hay accidentes, todo eso, y, y, y asaltan y todo, pero es lo normal. No, no, no como en otros lados que se ve todos los días casi. Date is February 4th, about time 11:20 20 around. And three guys came. It's a new face. About tall, about six foot, age about. 20 youngster, like a uh, high school basketball player like that. Skinny, uh, good moving. So I'm gonna ask them, what can I help you? He say, they realize me, oh, they, oh, we, we wanna buy soda. One guy going there, they took it, brought here one soda, right away, point to me a gun, with gun, 38 looks like. I'm turned around, it's a uh, hold up, hand, it's uh, open, open, open. You say open. I, I try to open. Right away, shoot me the, my, my, my foot. This shoot, but this through uh, this way, but this bottom hole is a big hole. I guess bullet about 38, I guess, big one. That's a bullet hole? Yeah. 
I want to see the lucky man. You lucky man. Lucky man. Lucky man. One of the bullets went yeah, through. Yeah, through this one, yeah. I don't like it. You don't like it? Why not? Huh? But you sell it. You don't like it? Ah, oh, this one toy only. <laughs> they shoot me a point three 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 bullet to us. Ask Emo what she thought when, when she heard. Do you hear the gunshot? Ask oh, him. yeah, she. Uh, she saw. What did she say? Uh, she said, uh, just, just my. I passed away. Uh, what did she say? It's everything, everything, everything gone. <laughs> he said, her fear is everything gone. So, she, she was yeah, dead. I heard. I heard that she cried. So. And Rosary too. Uh huh. So you, you feel better protected now? Oh sure, <laughs> sure. Feel much better. <laughs> when the news reached me that Mr. Han was sh had been shot, and I didn't know what his condition was, I was devastated. Not only myself, but most of the people in the neighborhood that I spoke with were devastated. All were concerned. All was very worried. All were just, uh, in a sense, outraged that such a thing could happen to a decent, hard-working citizen of this country. After riot, most stories have gone, I guess. But it's, uh, this robbery case, no way. Do you if, want to get the gun now? If, I'm trying, my wife doesn't like <laughs> No gun. That's why not anymore? Huh? Why, why not? I don't like somebody die. <laughs> Everybody. Too, too much trouble? Too much trouble. Yeah, I know, but uh, we don't like anybody, anybody die here. That's fine. The only, only thing we trust the God, God save us. The shooting at my aunt and uncle's store made me think more about my family in Detroit. So I decided to leave Los Angeles and return home to the city where I grew up and where questions still remain to be answered about my family's business and about my uncle's murder. I also wanted to know more about the city that I left 10 years before at a time when the auto factories were closing and when many others, like me, were also leaving the city. I wondered how life had changed for Korean Americans and African Americans alike. So I spoke with my family and with other people who live and work in Detroit and in the back of my mind, I thought that my uncle's murder didn't just take place in the instant that it took for the gun to fire, but over the decades of war down on the city. Question. What can you tell me about the shooting of Anselmo Hall at 15 Grand River yesterday, January 8th, 1992? Answer. I went to school first hour yesterday. I didn't go to class. I went to the lunchroom. I told Andre I wanted to borrow his gun because I wanted to do a stick-up. I knew Andre had a 38. Andre told me to get the gun out of the school locker. I got the gun and left the school. I got off the bus by Woodward and Cadillac Square. Started walking around looking for someone to rob. I was going to rob a person, but then I saw the Chinese man opening a jean fair. He looked like he was by himself, so I figured I could get more money from a business. Chinese man was the only one inside. He asked if he could help me. I told him I just want to look around. He said, okay. I went to the wall straight ahead from the front door and looked at the Calvins, ones I was wearing when the police arrested me today. When I came out of the changing room, I told him that I wanted the bull's hat I was wearing today. He put the hat on the counter. Then I told him I wanted a bull's T-shirt. He was behind the counter. He told me it was $300 for everything pulled out my gun, pointed it at him, told him to give me the money. He said he didn't have any money and said something about a safe. I said, give me those clothes. I backed towards the door and put the gun to my side and turned towards the door. I heard a click and heard him step. I turned and he was coming at me with a golf club. He had the club raised over his head and he was gonna hit me. I turned towards him, raised the gun and fired once. He fell backwards immediately.
story returns to the heart and to the home. You know, that old story, I mean, like uh, all the, you know, immigrant boat, steamship from Yokohama to San Francisco. Almost 10 years, my dream to come to United States, where that the liberty and the freedom. I started with business in uh, 1962. I'm the first one who pioneered into the black people's market, which really needed hair because of they don't have a long hair. First started as a fashion, like a Cadillac, I mean, uh, as a status symbol. Started Marie Marlo, started the Jacqueline Kennedy. So when you wear the wig, kind of a status symbol, like uh, behind the fur, mink. In the early 1960s, my father was one of the first Korean immigrants to set up a business in the African-American community. Before coming to Detroit, he started with a wig store in Los Angeles. Before the corner markets and the dry cleaners, the clothing stores and the swap meets, before any other business, Korean immigrants started by selling wigs to African-American women. Wigs, you can change uh, any style if you want blonde. Immediately you can be blonde I and mean, change into the wig. So uh, we have, uh, you know, about 10, 20, 30 style. Every day you can change, and every day you can uh, uh, change the color, too. Black people, not only fashion, but uh, they need hair, because uh, kinky hair at that time, you know, that, that they wanted to long hair, and just like a Western, uh, you know, white people. This, number one, is the tapered sassoon. Rene has been working for my family's business for over 20 years. The only difference in the 70s, they were all teased up, bouffanted. This also is back from the 60s and 70s. Most of the styles have all come back. All but this, this is a 90s look. The curl, the tight curl and the loose curls are in for the 90s. US hair tags, the original hair makers and the store. This is U.S. hair, and we made our own wig in Korea. I like to think of my father as a Henry Ford of wigs. He mass-produced them and brought down the prices, making them affordable for most African-American women. He also knew how to market them. One day I had an idea to advertise in the Sentinel in Los Angeles, a black people's newspaper, and I put it in saying that to buy direct from a factory. And then they came in. Everybody uh, buy, started by, and uh, without question. When I started in the Los Angeles, too, a lot of uh, uh, movie stars came to my store. And then they bought wigs. Diana Ross was here a you know, long time ago. Like any other immigrant business, when one person succeeds, others fall in their footsteps. It was the same for my father who started the wig business for Koreans. Other Korean immigrants soon set up wig stores all around Los Angeles. In the late 60s, the tough competition soon forced him to look for greener pastures outside of LA. He searched for another city with a larger African-American population. And the first I picked up is uh, uh, Detroit, because at that time, a lot of uh, thousand uh, black people employed by GM, Ford, Chrysler, and a uh, lot of black people came in in the highest wages here. Most of black people are hardworking and very nice people. And uh, I have no trouble. And, uh, you know, we have just like uh, that time, even uh, we also, as an Oriental, we had uh, uh, as a minority and the kind of uh, we had a discriminatory, uh, you know, uh, not like uh, black people, but uh, we had a similar kind of uh, uh, treatment. After earning his graduate business degree from the University of Southern California, my father couldn't find a decent job, partly because of his race. So he went to washing dishes. It was then that he decided to open up his own business. People have this fear that someone is out to do them harm just because they come to the city of Detroit. A million people live here. You know, this is my home. 
and I have a lot of friends that live here and wouldn't live anywhere else. And we always marvel at the notion that someone would think that because they came into town, they were going to be injured. This neighborhood, for as long as I can remember, was predominantly a black residential neighborhood. It had some multifamily homes and some single family homes. Most of them, as you can see, are no longer here. But it used to be a very thriving community with a lot of people out and about and going downtown to shop and things of that nature. But as you can see, it's very quiet now. What we're standing on right now is an overpass on the Chrysler Freeway, and Hastings Street ran somewhere along here. Hastings Street was one of those areas where there were black businesses, black clubs. It was a place where we could go. It was a place that was jumping, it was alive. You didn't feel intimidated, you didn't feel threatened, you were among your own people. It was home. This is where it was, and as you can see, only thing happening here now is the expressway. Back in the 40s and into the early 50s even, there were a lot of places that blacks could not go that were run by white business owners. And so we had to rely on each other and the businesses within our communities to do our shopping. Once those businesses were closed up as a result of urban renewal, they weren't reopened. And that cut deeply into the ability of blacks to network and to keep money within their own community. We'll go someplace and try to borrow money so that we can open a business and we'll get turned down on the loan. And then a couple of months later, a business will open up in the location that we wanted that we couldn't get the loan for. And someone that's just migrated to this country will be running the store and you wonder how is it that that happens. We were born here. We've been here for 300 years and somebody can come in and be here for six months and all of a sudden they're running a business making money and we're still trying to find a way to get involved in the American dream and the whole business process. So there are a number of reasons that cause that tension. Many of which are not the fault of the immigrant merchant that opens the store. But that's who you can see and that's who you would take your aggression out on as a result of the frustration you feel because you're denied the same opportunity, presumably, that that person has gotten. I guess when I first moved into Detroit, there were predominantly more African Americans in the city than there were white people. As we moved into the city, a lot of white people were moving out of the city, including our neighborhood. and. Um, and I remembered wanting to be black just so that I can fit in. Um, then when my parents moved out to the suburb, I wanted to be white just so that I can fit in. I was very uncomfortable with the way I looked. I never felt that way until I came to the United States. I used to cry all the time because I used to say that I missed my friends in Korea. One time my parents came back home from work and Apparently my mother wasn't feeling very well and um, <clears throat> my father walked in through the door and uh, I started crying again and I guess my dad was kind of fed up with it and he said, you know, you kids are not the only person who are having a difficult time in the States. And, and when he, by what he said at that moment, I, I realized that my parents were having some difficult time as well. My father was a veterinarian in Korea. He never wanted to do business. His ideal goal was to come here and become a veterinarian. And that's what he truly envisioned um, he was going to do once he came to the States. Your English, your communication skill is lacking. So what can you do? Um, you can work for someone else for um, minimum wages. But for people who have dreams and ambitions, you're going to save up every little penny you have and really put the American, t American dream to test. And that is build up something for myself, go into my own business, and make it big there. Because that's the way America has been portrayed to other nations. And that is, is that this is a land of opportunity. I cannot explain to you 
the feelings that I have watching my parents work six days out of seven days and working so hard and getting beaten at times and um, getting wounded at times. I feel like I'm describing some sort of a battlefield, but that's the way it was. You know, my parents also loved the neighborhood too. You know, my mom had a couple of really great customers and my father had a couple of great customers who'd always come by, not always to buy things, but just come by to chat with my parents. Folks walk in and they make the little comments, trying to turn to, oh, I ain't shopping in here. It's a Chinese store, it's an Asian store, and they make these clothes in the back. Those kind of comments you have. How do you feel about that? Well, the way I look at it, I remember I grew up in the 60s. I'm, a, I'm not that young. I may look young, but I'm not that young. Um, and I can remember when uh, white America used to treat black people the same way. So I just see it as uh, what the black folks have been taught from a learned behavior from that situation. Then they turn around and use it against other immigrants or other folks from other countries. I've learned to speak Korean. I've learned to eat Korean. I've learned to uh, learn Korean customs. The media portrayed um, L.A. L.A. and New York yeah, as the, the Koreans are um, nasty to, towards the black people in the community. So, Because it wasn't, that, it wasn't that much tension in Detroit until the situation in L.A. Growing yeah. up in Detroit, being biracial, I don't have any problems now, but in my earlier childhood I did. Um, I was called, you know, Chinese and other, you know, yeah, Asian I was called names. names like that too, War be, Babies, yeah. and <laughs> they came up with the name Amerasian. So I always say Amerasian because I don't want to leave out the Korean side, nor the Afro-American side, because I have Korean friends and I have Afro-American friends. Therefore, you have to remember both. I eat American food and I eat Korean food. So I feel, you know, on my mom's behalf, why be ashamed, not being ashamed of her, but why leave her out? Or but I feel that ask. most Koreans that are nice to me, that are really nice, is because they might know my mom or something like that. But other than that, no, we're just ordinary. They look at us as black children, you know? In the Korean, in the Korean community. And in the, in the black community. They look, at the, they look at us as if, what are you? <laughs> <laughs> they don't consider us you know, as they are, they always say, what are you? What are you mixed with? Are you Chinese or something like that? So we're taught to go to college, get a good job, and work for somebody, and then retire, and then that. Instead of work for somebody, learn like, their practices, and open the business for yourself, and become a millionaire just like they did. But you see, the, um, the African-American community been here for a long time, what, over 400 years, and the Koreans, when they are established here, they don't want their kids to work at the stores also. They want, you know, their kids to go to college and have a better life than they do also, just like the black community. 400 know? years we was here, but we can't count 400 years as being free. We had maybe almost at least, what, 25, 30 years now that we have the opportunities. You have to also think about there's a lot of discrimination against black people in society today, and a lot of things that you know, I think that there's more discrimination against a black man than there is against a Korean man. Yeah, that's Therefore, true. a Korean person could get further than a black person just by nearly because of the color of their skin. So I think that's a problem with the black community. There's still a lot of racism here. I think you're born into your craft, you know, and either you're researching it through just experiences day to day or you actually be practicing it by writing. At the same time, I'm thinking like an artist. I'm thinking in a very critical, analytical way about my surroundings. I'm trying to capture those on paper in some kind of way. It is the real me opening your head, opening your cyst. It is the real me leaking poems into your lips, splitting your atoms. You are vinegar sweet with Mars in your eyes. I am brick wet blood. You still searching for the real me, walking up my tongue, claustrophobic in my head. It is a real me coughing you out. My hands are real, choking you at poem level, ritual death. You rise above my saliva, a lion chewing my remains. So Detroit, uh, 
historically was it was a blue collar town and is a blue collar town but it was stronger back in the 60s because the economy was at such a point that jobs were available almost without any problem you know in, in factories factories were hiring all the time in the neighborhood i lived in the older people in the neighborhood were pushing the young blacks to get jobs in factories and that would be their future you would work for the plant all of your life and retire and, uh, and get your benefits that was the utopia that was the utopian society for people who had very little and had to scratch very hard to try to get something one of the things that happened in segregation is that black people had to band together and they had to live as a community and that existed all the way up until the time when integration came along now you look around the community you see people homeless you see people people addicted to crack who are homeless you see people who might be schizophrenic whatever terms you want to use who are homeless and people who just don't have a job who are homeless that's a cancer you know i mean that's a, that's that's a sign of capitalism destroying being destroyed internally it's like it's not able to take care of the population what are you going to do man what are you going to do you're going to walk inside a cold train note you're going to shriek inside a jerry curl? You're going to eat that welfare check from the White House? You're going to be a fly jiggaboo queen? You're going to be a fly jiggaboo man? What are you going to do, man? What are you going to do? You're going to be disguised as a nigger? You're going to out nigger a bigger nigger? You're going to wear that fake laugh? You're going to be shot in your wallet? You're going to die in this poem? What are you going to do, man? What are you going to do? There is a de facto apartheid that exists in America generally, rather Detroit area or any other area. You know, uh, and there's only small pockets of areas where there's true, um, I don't even know if that can be used, but I can say recognizable interaction between races in a community. And when we look at our community and we look at the faces of the people and the, and the, and the, the people who occupy businesses and institutions in our community, a lot of times we don't see our own people there. The result of that is that a lot of blacks think of an occupying or a hostile force embedded right into their community. What are you going to do, man? You're going to manufacture a neighborhood? You're going to stick your stick in someone's life? You're going to choke the blood of your dreams? You're going to impregnate lunacy? You're going to be in a prison statistics? You're going to be a backyard abortion? You're going to be the toilet of politicians? You're going to be, you're going to be, you're going to be, huh? What are you going to do, man? What are you going to do? If we have a value for life, we have recourse to work out our problems that, that won't be necessarily violent, you know. Um, and I think with the Arab store owners, even the Asian or Korean store owners, that this uh, value of life on both sides is non-existent. And, and they begin to see each other more as symbols of inferiority or symbols of occupying force never look at the humanity behind that person. This neighborhood, when I was a youngster, was always an integrated neighborhood with a, a fairly substantial black population. And this is the street that I spent probably half of my younger years on. It's called Parker. And over here you had some Italian residents, German residents, Polish, and blacks. It was a very... Uh, close-knit neighborhood and if there was any racism involved I never knew it not over here in this area I would no more have thought to throw a rock get in a fight or yell at somebody over here than I would in front of my own house primarily because of the fact that I never knew who might see me and my father would find out what I had done before I got home and that's just the way the neighborhood was. After the 1967 riot, I think a lot of whites felt very uneasy and uncomfortable living in the city of Detroit. Racial tension was at an all-time high for my lifetime. And they just felt that uh, they wanted to move to a place where they would feel safer. So they moved out of the city. The week before that riot started in 1967, I had walked from my house over to the area where that riot started one Sunday morning. 
and it was really a very pleasant walk and you never would have anticipated that anything like that was about to happen in such a short period of time, although there was a lot of racial tension back then. After I had uh, all this white uh, running out and then uh, black concentrate uh, in a city and uh, Korean become the store owner. Without the Koreans, there's no downtown, period. It's like Koreatown. It's like a downtown Chinatown in cities. Otherwise, it'd just be empty. Well, as a kid, man, I remember coming down here, man. It, it was so busy down here. You could barely get down through here. People going from shop to shop. A lot of business was here. My father worked for the plant, and it, basically everybody, every working male, had a, either a plant job or some type of uh, labor job. When the auto plants closed down, it just hurt everybody. Industries have all moved out, going out of the country and everywhere else, and it's just not here anymore. Not like it used to be. Hudson's, as you know, is like one of the biggest department stores in Detroit. When they shut down, business itself started dwindling. You would come and you wouldn't see as many people. After that, a lot of Korean-owned businesses started coming in. It wasn't like it, we shut our eyes and then the Korean people just came in overnight. Before then, I think uh, most of these businesses down here were Jewish-owned businesses. There used to be a lot of Jewish stores. Without the Koreans, there's no downtown. They're strong enough to hope everything will get better and come back. Like, that's the way I feel because I've been working down here all these years. It's just like, if it doesn't come back, it's just a waste of time. This neighborhood has been, uh, at one time, was the prime area of the downtown area. Since then, it's, you know, I said the last 10 years, it's, um, it's kind of gone down. But we plan on trying to revive it, and it's back on the upswing, you know. We've been here for three years, and uh, we plan on being a major, playing a major role in the upswing of downtown Detroit. This building was sitting uh, for almost 30 years. It, w hadn't, it hadn't been occupied since 1967. And at that time, it was a clothing store back in the 60s. Uh, the owners just let it, just kind of just let it sit and use it for a storage area. And uh, cause there, because of the area was kind of run down and there was no business. But uh, as, as you see since then, we've taken it and turned it into a lucrative hair salon. And uh, we're quite successful. It feels good to walk into your own business and be your own boss. It's challenging, and I love it. I wouldn't trade it for the world. Muslims teach, we teach to, to uh, build within our own community and teach to help build your culture and revive. That's the thing we really concentrate on. Um, Islam is just basically what, where our culture was before we came over here to this country. And it, Islam teaches you just to uh, work together, build yourself as a, as a people, and stick together. So. We've had a lot of good response in our business by being Muslim. A lot of, a lot of support from other Muslim businesses. And uh, I think that, that's very important for us as a community, is to learn to work together as, as, a, as, as a culture. Most of our clients are African American. We have um, some Caucasian customers and some Asian customers. But primar primarily, it's our black community who supports us. Right down the street, on two blocks over, there's a, there's a cleaner's over there, and uh, he's he's a, he's he's an Asian, he's Korean, and I, he does my clothes for me, and he has he's been there for years, and we talk about uh, constantly talking about how his business has went down, you know, over the period of years, and that he's but he, I think he's in a, in a position to hang on to see it come back around, you know. So we've talked several times about uh, trying to hang on until the area comes back. You know what? I'm gonna be honest with you. You know, what I think the tension is. I think the tension is the crime. The tension is the frustration of no jobs. I think the tension is the frustration of can't walk down the street, can't even walk to your car without being mugged. I think the tension is the crack. I think the tension is the, 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 the high level of stress. So the thing is not the Asian, not the African American, not the Caucasian. It's about building a community and getting rid of the crime. I remember that day very well because um, I got to work early in the morning and um, I had a lot of things to do at work. I got a phone call from Renee 
Um, he's an employee at your dad's store. And uh, he called me and he said, Ellen, this is Renee. You have to come down here. And I was thinking, come down where? He said, you have to come to your father's store. And he wouldn't tell me what was happening. So he just said, I just have to come down there. And right away I thought, oh no, something is wrong. So I, I wasn't really sure what was going on. Um, all I knew was that I had to get there. I told everyone that um, I was somewhat flustered and I said, there's something wrong at my dad's store. I've got to go. i, I got to go now. Little did I know what was really going on. When I got to my father's store general area, I saw all these police cars and, and I saw these TV cameras and I thought, oh my God. My father's been taken hostage. So I was trying to go into my father's store, but the police officer sort of blocked my way, and he wouldn't let me go in. And so I said, is my father in there? He wouldn't say anything. Then I knew that my father was not taken hostage. And then all of a sudden, I felt this something drop in my stomach. And I said, can you just tell me if he's alive? And when he didn't say anything, I don't know where that sound came from, but everything that I had of me from the deep, from the bottom of my stomach just came out. And I remember yelling out, no. And I just knew, I knew my father was dead. Family members and friends, not wanting to believe what had happened, understandably and visibly shaken, upset and angry all at the same time, because 57-year-old Anselmo Ha, a friend, father, husband, and downtown Detroit merchant, had been murdered as he prepared his store for the day's business. Mr. Ha came to the United States many years ago seeking a better life. He worked downtown for 10 years. His daughter feared for his safety. I always worry about things like this all the time. And sometimes after school and after work, I always used to come and visit him to help him close the store. His brother-in-law, also a downtown businessman, says they have begged for more protection. He blames police and the mayor. It's no protection here. It's an empty house here. Right heart of his heart. He cannot protect his heart. The criminals, they know that there's no, no protection here. You see, all these small businesses, these are bits and pieces of American dreams. We all came here with a dream, with a piece of dream. If not for an image, my uncle's death would not be a story for others to hear and to see in Detroit. Immediately after learning of my uncle's murder, my father called the local television news stations. He was tired of the crime downtown and wanted others to know what was happening. And by chance, William Archie, a Detroit free press photographer, happened to come across the scene outside my uncle's store and captured the image that put my uncle's story on the front page. In a city of shattered dreams and broken promises, my uncle's death still resonates. Even to this day, I come upon people who remember his story. Do you know, when I first started living in Detroit, I lived in a building. It, was, it wasn't as nice as this. In fact, it was kind of scary to live in that building. But I remember my first night in Detroit, I heard a gunshot. Right away, I woke up. I was like, oh my god, should I call the police? And then right away, I heard the police siren. So I knew that I didn't have to call the police. And then a couple of nights later, I heard someone screaming. I felt fear for the victim who was being taken advantage of. But what really surprised me was after a couple of gunshots and after a couple of violence out in the street, I was able to fall asleep. And that's what frightened me. And that's why when I think that, how could no one hear anything when there was a gunshot fired at my father's store? It was normal for people in Detroit to hear gunshot. So it, it wasn't so extraordinary 
that there was a gunshot and someone had died. The reason that the incident stuck out in my mind so much is not because it was an Asian that was killed, it was a human being that was killed. And it's right here in the downtown area. And I don't think the child that did the murder was probably even thinking about race. He's just want to rob somebody. Just like he robbed your store, he can come down here and rob our store. So that, you know, makes us be more on the defensive and watching who comes into our business. You know, and it was, I remember it very well because it's, I mean, we're right here. We're all together and we're all working down here together. And we should be more concerned about what's going on with each other. When you isolate it down to one person, the, the family suffers, the hurt, the pain. But that family's crying out as a voice for, all, for, for millions of other families in the country that some took place at the exact same time. Their uncle, their father, their brother, their sister got shot. So we, we're victims. You know, we're all victims of, of a society that is based upon, to me, violence. From what I understand, um, Irvin Jennings came from a pretty good family background. From what I understand and from what I was able to see of his mother, I knew that she was a hardworking mother. I knew that she did her best to raise her kids, including Irvin Jennings. And I'm sure sh that she did not raise her kids so that he can go ahead and shoot someone for petty cash or for a couple of pairs of jeans. But you see, she had no control over whom her kids were going to have contact with. Irvin Jennings was arrested at his high school the day after my uncle's murder. He had no previous history of arrest. At his trial, Jennings, at age 17, faced first-degree murder charges, which in Michigan carry a mandatory life sentence without parole. When the jury came back with the first-degree murder, and I knew that Irvin Jennings had to stay in prison for the rest of his life, I, I really can't describe to you how I felt, because I felt guilty about feeling how awful it must be for Irvin Jennings' mother knowing that her child will grow up in jail because I, I knew that I, I couldn't feel that way for someone who killed my father. But I, I felt as if, though, that there was really no justice for everyone, for anyone. When I look back at how we ignore the problems in our cities, I think of my uncle's mother in Korea. Now in her 90s, she lives in a world of silence and darkness. She has lost her sight and hearing. My family believes that if she is told about my uncle's death, the shock would be so great that she wouldn't survive. So to this day, my family doesn't tell of the day that her son was murdered at his store. And when she asks about her son in America, my family tells her lies, so she continues to believe that her son has made the Great Migration, raised a family, and lived his piece of the dream. <laughs>